Ross, would you like to open, formally open the session for us, please? Thanks very much, uh, Rob. Welcome everybody to um, Hampshire Chambers, uh, Chamber of Solutions, working in partnership with Mission Performance and Menzies. Um, this um, program is, is designed to allow members of Hampshire Chamber and other businesses to share practice, to learn from each other, to understand the challenges that they're facing. And there can be no better time for this to be launched than now. I can't say that it was intended that it would be launched on Zoom, but it's probably a very good thing that it is because this will be a good opportunity to address these major issues that we're all facing at, the, at this time. Change is now. The future impact that we are going to be feeling as a result of these changes is going to be long term. And there's an opportunity, I believe, to rebuild our businesses in a way that could be seen as a positive opportunity. That may not be seemingly so now, but I think as the months go by, we'll start to see that that's the case. We've therefore organized initially four sessions uh, during April. These were at the same time, 9.30 every Tuesday, running throughout the whole of April. And they're covering today employment matters, but business distress looking to the future, funding issues, cash flow issues. So please do book yourselves onto the other sessions. But most importantly, this is your opportunity to share practice. This is really your business community to see you through these very challenging times. And so I welcome you to it. But before we start, I just thought I would like to say that obviously today our thoughts and our prayers are with our Prime Minister. And uh, I really do hope that uh, some good news in that direction comes through in the course of the day. Um, but many thanks for joining and uh, look forward to participating with you today. And I'll hand over, hand back to uh, Rob and to Dave. Thank you, Ross. Um, with such a great response, we need to outline a few housekeeping <laughs> rules to keep us all on track and a few points to help us uh, make the most of this virtual uh, experience. I've, uh, I've muted you all. Um, the panel are not muted so that we can um, and discuss uh, things um, efficiently. But when we need to, uh, you need to make a point or raise a question, then we will bring you in via the chat function. We will be monitoring that with um, Bob, the moderator, and Dave Gosling and myself as co-chairs will be scanning those messages and feeding those in to the panel. You can share an experience by raising a hand on your participant panel. If you go down to the bottom of the panel there, under the more button, there is a icon which um, is a raised hand. When you click on that, if you want to make a point, your name will go to the top of the, of the participants list and we will pick up your question and feed it in to the panel. Firstly, if you wanted to just ask a question, then we kindly ask that you state your name, your business and your sector, if you feel comfortable doing that. If not, just feed in your question. And again, it will go to the top of the message uh, board picked up by Bob and fed into uh, myself and Dave. That's a little bit about the housekeeping, um, a little bit more about the panel. Um, I will be chairing this panel along with Dave uh, Gosling. I'm one of the co-founding directors of Mission Performance Limited. We're a professional services business that focuses on changing behavior um, to improve performance. We do that globally and have been doing it for the last two decades. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here uh, on this first um, session. Dave, would you like to say a few words about yeah. yourself? And yep, certainly. So, so I'm a partner at Menzies. Um, I head up our student office, which is based in Whiteley, uh, and I'm also a member of Menzies uh, Management Committee. Um, Menzies uh, deal with uh, a number of uh, owner-managed businesses. So for the last few weeks, I've spent a lot of time speaking to owners about the, uh, the various issues they're facing at the moment. Great. Thank you, Dave. And uh, Matt? Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Burgess. I am Director of Communication at Mission Performance. Uh, an actor of 20 years working in theatre, television and film. I now head up the comm squad at Mission Performance, who are a group of uh, theatre practitioners, actors, directors who work globally with both organisations and individuals helping them in the way that they communicate. Thank you, Matt. Ed? Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, my name's Ed Hussey. I'm the head of people solutions um, at Menzies. Uh, so we're HR professionals providing outsourced HR services and strategic advice as part of a wider employment group in, in Menzies, but also covers payroll services, employment tax specialists, pension benefits, and share schemes. Our experience with furloughing, as our, is like everyone else's, has been sudden and unexpected. Uh, but we've put all our efforts into understanding and interpreting the guidance that's emerged bit by bit and working with clients to help them work it into their plans for survival and then re-emergence later. Great. Thank you, Ed. Andrew? Good morning, everyone. My name's Andrew Wilshire. I'm an employment solicitor with Paris Smith based in Southampton. Um, I've been advising on the job retention scheme um, and also uh, coronavirus queries generally from employers and employees. Um, as well as general um, employment-related matters as well. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Tracy? Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Tracy Shrimpton from Six Sense Marketing. We provide marketing communication support to uh, small and medium businesses. Um, I also support two business improvement districts as well. So we've been providing um, guidance and signposting support to over 500 businesses and helping them to take advantage of sort of the digital opportunities at the moment. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Before we go into the format of the session, and straight into the meat of the discussion, a couple of things. Uh, somebody has asked, can you go over the raised hand protocol? So if you go to your participant panel, you get that participant panel up by clicking on the bottom of your screen on the toolbar with the word participants. Click on that, a pop-up appears in front of you. At the bottom of that panel, you've got a uh, yes or no uh, and lots of different icons there. If you click on the more button with three buttons next to each other, or three dots, you will see the raised hand icon along with a coffee cup, clapping hands, etc. Click on the raised hands and your name will then go to the top and we can then come and uh, message or you message us and we can bring your point into the discussion. In order to conserve broadband as well, for those that aren't on the panel, we'd request that you um, switch off your, your videos at your end so that we can um, improve the uh, uh, the experience for all. Thank you very much for doing that. We have gone through your questions. Again, thank you very much for the questions that you sent in. We've themed them, we've looked at them, we were spent the last couple of days uh, researching them. So we'll start with those questions that you've asked already. We'll then go to the chat function, bringing in some questions from you, and then we'll look at uh, panel insights. Try to make it as a uh, discursive, discussion-based as we possibly can. So here we go. This is the first of the questions. And this one is to you, Ed. It's tell us a little bit more about furloughing, big picture objectives all the way down to some of the very specific actions that we can take to access it. Uh, over to you, Ed. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, and what I'll do is I'll spend a few minutes uh, providing an overview of the scheme within which um, we'll try to pick up some of the questions that people have very kindly submitted before the event. Um, I will cover um, some of the basic aspects of the scheme, and then Andrew will pick up one or two of the more legal um, sides to it. Um, so the scheme is a genuine attempt by the government to protect jobs and companies, and therefore the economy during this period, um, in the hope that companies have everything still in place to pick up again quickly uh, when the time comes. So what they're doing is uh, offering to cover 80% of usual monthly wage costs of employees to a maximum of £2,500 per employee per month for employees who, for whom there is no work. So these are going to be furloughed employees who are effectively sent home. Um, the employer can claim back those costs under the scheme um, in addition to which, they can add their employer's national insurance contributions and their minimum employer pension auto enrolment contributions. Um, it's for companies who operated a PAYE scheme on the 28th of February this year. Um, and there was something new in the guidance issued this weekend, actually. Another tranche of guidance came out on Saturday. Um, which is that you also need to be enrolled with HMRC for, the, for, for what's called PAY online. So if you didn't originally register your payroll online, 
you will need to go to the gov.uk website and enrol now and that can take a few days to, to sort out so you will need to provide your epay number when you when you make a claim so just a, a, an early tip there just to check that um, in terms of the employees who qualify under the scheme, they're basically defined as anyone subject to UK PAYE who was on your payroll on the 28th of February. So, and that includes all contract types and foreign nationals. If you already let people go after the 28th of February due to coronavirus, coronavirus you can re-employ them and put them on furlough. So that again, they're available to work uh, later. If you laid some people off, in other words, you kept them employed but sent them home with reduced or no pay, you can backdate your furlough payment claims back to the 1st of March. What you can't do, however, is furlough anyone that you newly hired after the 28th of February. Um, a condition of furlough is that the employee may not work for the business. Um, and the most recent guidance, again, over the weekend, added to that, that you're free to allocate business critical tasks to employees who are not furloughed. And so what that says to me is it reinforces the position of the government with, that they, the employees are not to undertake work whilst they are on furlough. What you can do is bring someone off furlough um, after a minimum three week period to complete necessary tasks. And then you could put them back on furlough again after they've done that. So I certainly know some of, some of the clients we've spoken to, it might be for example, a finance person who's got a month end routines. They do a three month minimum furlough. It's time that they can then come off, complete some tasks and then go back on again. Obviously, alternatively, you can reallocate tasks to other people who aren't going to be furloughed. So there is, a, there is some flexibility, but it seems quite clear that no work should be done by those on furlough. Um, statutory directors was a question that came up quite a lot. Statutory directors um, can be furloughed, but you can only claim for their PAYE salary, which if their owners can, of course, be minimal. Um, the only thing a director is allowed to do whilst on furlough is carry out their statutory duties. But that doesn't include normal work, including generating revenue or pro providing services um, to the company. So that seems fairly limited for directors. Okay. Um, an important point is that someone working reduced hours or pay, which many people have been, don't get any support through the scheme. So the scheme is only for people who are not working at all. So you need to maximise the extent to which you kind of send home whole people, if you like, and then reorganise around that, um, rather than necessarily looking at reducing overall pay and hours you don't get support for that um, but of course i appreciate that it a lot depends on how your business in org is organized and some clients need a bit of everyone whereas other clients can re can more easily reorganize things in order to furlough a group of people and then receive that government grant um, Fortunately, uh, the, 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 the more guidance we've had, the more flexible it's proving to be than we might have originally thought. Um, so a, a minimum furlough period is three weeks. Um, but after that, you can bring people back and furlough them again later. Um, you can also furlough some people now and then some, more, some, some later as the situation changes. So to all of those people who asked um, if you can be flexible about rotating people and bringing people in and out, the answer is basically yes. But to make a furlough claim, you're looking at minimum periods of three weeks on furlough. Um, furloughed workers can work elsewhere while they're on furlough. 
um, but subject to any restrictions you agree with them because they're still your employee and you might want them to be fit and available um, when, when you need them. Um, contracts um, which need to be looked at. Andrew will cover more about agreements and contracts in a, in a little bit. Let's, let's just talk briefly about applying for the grants. It's going to be via a portal that HMRC is setting up and it's due to open up towards the end of this month. It appears that the details you're required to submit aren't very complicated in the sense that it's your EPAYE number, the number of staff you're furloughing, the claim period, the amount being claimed, and your contact and bank account details. It looks as if HMRC are not going to do highly detailed checks at the point of claim and will pay over the money hopefully quite quickly and they'll pay it directly into your bank account. Um, what they're saying is that they will be doing retrospective audits. Um, so obviously at some point in the future, you may get audited and so obviously you'll need your records in order for if that happens. The downside is that companies have to make their own calculation uh, of, of what they're claiming um, and then make the necessary adjustments to their payroll. Um, so for salaried employees, you'll be basing your claim on 80% of salary as at the 28th of February. And for those on hourly or variable contracts, it will be based on either the same month's earnings last year or an average across the 2019-20 tax year. More guidance will come out on that when the claims portal opens. Um, we had some useful clarification over the weekend um, about pay elements that can be included or excluded. So you could so you include regular payments that you're obliged to pay, like past overtime, fees, and compulsory commissions but exclude discretionary payments such as bonuses, tips, and other commissions. Many clients have asked us whether they need to continue paying salaries until the grant money arrives. And the answer is you need to do the right thing for your cash flow and your long-term survival. And obviously there are a lot of things to weigh in the balance there in terms of the impact on your staff as well as the survival of your business. So for some, this means that they funded salaries in the meantime, so they furloughed their employees, they will continue to pay salaries at the furloughed rate, if that's what they're doing. Um, and then they will make a then they will make a claim that's backdated to be reimbursed. For others for whom that cash flow doesn't exist is not available. They're simply having to ask their staff to wait until the grant monies are received in order to get paid. Um, the government expects that you'll be looking at the other facilities that are available to ease your cash flow during that period, so that you, which may help you to, to keep those salaries in payment until you can play. The other thing just to mention on that is you can top up the furlough. You, you've got to pass on any money you receive from the government it's up to that two and a half thousand pound limit you've got to use as gross salary for your furloughed employees. You can choose to top that up um, and it's up to you, but obviously that's at your, that's at your cost. So that covers some of the main points. I know it covers some, but probably not all of the questions that have been submitted so far, but I think I should definitely at this point pass the baton on and uh, so that we can get more into responding to some of your more spontaneous questions but Andrew first I think is going to deal with some of the more legal aspects. Ed, before you hand over to Andrew we've had a couple of questions from the floor so someone's asked okay. about registering for any pay, uh, POI number um, and just questioned uh, you know who would do that I mean I'd imagine the majority of people on here their accountant would do that for them would that be right? Yeah check with if your accountant is doing your payroll then check with your accountant they may well have set your uh, payroll up online anyway so you might that may already be in place mm -hmm. if you're doing your own payroll then hopefully you'll be aware of whether that's something you, you have in place or not it's a it, if you need to enroll you just go onto the gov.uk website um, 
and do it there. Okay, and then a second question we had was um, about timings of the payment where someone's mentioned June. So my understanding was the June was for self-employed, but the, for companies, the, the, the plan was for the payments to come out quicker. Just yes. Update on yeah, that. we would definitely hope payments are coming out earlier. I mean, we don't know exactly. So the portal will open at the, for claims at the end of April. Um, we don't have a precise date. And we're hoping, it, it seems that they're not going to spend a long time checking things up front. They're preferring to kind of say we're going to audit later. And one hopes that that's because they're going to turn these payments around pretty quickly. So you submit a claim, you get a payment into your bank account. Okay. So I'm, it sounds as if they're trying to make sure that that's done as quickly as possible, recognising that there are employees on the end of this, many of whom are actually waiting for a salary. So um, hopefully, so I, I, I will, it's very difficult to um, see that payments are still going to be outstanding in June for claims that are made at the end of April. Uh, Ed. Um, let's go to Andrew and I'm going to pick up some more questions uh, that have been fed into Dave. So Andrew, the uh, floor's yours. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to comment, um, first of all, on how you actually implement the scheme. Um, the first thing to consider is, from an employer's point of view is the process of putting people on furlough leave. And if you're furloughing an entire team, then it's a bit more straightforward and I'll come on to that. Um, if not, then you'll need to, to designate those employees within a team who you are going to furlough. So, for example, if you've got a team of six and you only want to furlough three of those six, how are you going to choose which of those three to put on furlough leave? And um, some employers are going down quite a safe option, um, which would involve applying um, some kind of selection criteria or selection matrix to those group of people, um, which is quite similar or akin to a, a usual redundancy process. Um, however, the issue with that for many employers is actually the practicalities and um, having the time to go through that process. So some employers are doing that, um, but not all employers. Um, so for those employers who aren't going down that route, they might be going down the volunteer route and simply saying, we need to furlough some staff. Can we please have volunteers being put on furlough leave? And once they've got the required number to go on furlough, they'll be selected and the remaining um, people will continue in their jobs. So that needs to be considered. The, the thing that does need to be borne in mind here is that what's come through from the government guidance and also ACAS guidance is that usual employment law principles still apply. So discrimination law under the Equality Act is still in force, meaning that what you can't do is discriminate in terms of how you select those for furlough leave or designate those for furlough leave. So, for example, if you had um, disabled employees, you wouldn't be able to say, well, actually, we're going to designate you um, or simply say we're going to designate all women or all men. So that needs to be taken into account as well, um, because, of course, an employee can still bring a discrimination claim or um, a potential constructive unfair dismissal claim during this period of time. The furlough leave does not um, waive those rights. Um, the other point to mention is consent. Um, the guidance suggests that you need to put employees on furlough leave with their agreement. Um, in certain situations, um, it may be that consent is not required. For example, if um, you are topping up their pay to 100% and they don't have variable elements to their pay. However, um, we think that in most situations, the cautious approach is probably to get employees' consent in each situation. Um, and the further government guidance over the weekend has confirmed that that should be in writing. So we recommend that you write to those employees who you're designating to put on furlough leave. You explain the situation clearly to them, the terms of their furlough, um, and then seek their consent, and it would be sensible to get a signed letter from them returned to you in writing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to comment on was um, collective consultation. We've had some queries on that. Um, collective consultation applies when you are proposing to dismiss 20 or more employees um, over a 90-day period. Now, um, in a redundancy situation, you would need to either consult with a trade union or with elected employee representatives. Um, but the key query there is, uh, or the key term is when you're proposing to dismiss. Um, and in this situation with the furlough, 
um, it may be that employers are saying, well, at the moment, we're not proposing to dismiss. We're simply um, taking advantage of the government scheme. Um, at this moment in time, we don't envisage making redundancies or we don't want to make redundancies. And therefore, the obligation to collectively consult may not be um, actually in force yet. However, that could change over the course of the furlough period. <coughs> excuse me um, and so you do need to keep an eye on that because as soon as you are proposing to dismiss um, the collective consultation obligations will kick in um, i just wanted to comment on on holiday and furlough leave as well because we're getting some queries on that and unfortunately the position is unclear um, the government have um, provided several updates to their guidance but they haven't as yet commented on the use of holiday or annual leave during the furlough period and the ACAS guidance seems to suggest that you perhaps can't take annual leave and furlough leave at the same time um, but it does say that you can take a bank holiday at the same time and of course a bank holiday is really no different to any other annual leave so um, we think although this is not clear we think that the position probably is that the employee can take annual leave during the furlough leave period and that would include bank holidays what is less clear is if the employer can actually request that the employee takes holiday during the furlough leave period. Of course, under usual employment law principles, um, an employer can request an employee takes holiday if they give requisite notice, which is double the amount of time they want the employee to take. However, in this situation, in a furlough leave situation, um, it would seem almost against the, the aim or the purpose of the scheme if an employer could simply say, well, we want you to take, you know, a month or, or or whatever of your annual leave entitlement during the furlough leave period and effectively run down an employee's annual leave extremely quickly. So um, I think it's less clear and probably less likely that an employer could request an employee takes um, a significant proportion or any holiday during their furlough leave period. The other query with regards to holiday, holiday is holiday pay. Um, now it's established law now that holiday pay should represent normal remuneration. So um, if an employee just has a basic salary, then that's uh, more straightforward. If they have regular overtime payments or regular commission payments, then the law is clear now that that should be included in the holiday pay calculation. So the query during furlough leave will be, well, if an employer is only paying 80% of an employee's wages, and they then go on holiday, should they be topping up that pay to 100% of wages and should that include overtime and commission? Or um, is it the case that actually their normal remuneration now is what the, what the pay is on furlough, whether that be 80% or, or, what, or whatever they're being paid? So um, that is also unclear. The safe option is of course to simply pay pre-furlough leave wages and any overtime or commission if that's part of normal remuneration but um, that's not clear as yet from the guidance. Um, just also to say on holiday, um, the regulations have been amended to say that if it's not reasonably practicable for an employee to take their four weeks um, holiday um, during this holiday year, um, as a result of the coronavirus, then they are able to carry that over for the next two years. The key term there is what's reasonably practicable. So um, it may be the case that employee, employees actually can take it this year, um, but if not, then they are able to carry it over for two years. Um, just speaking about SSP, statutory sick pay briefly, um, the government guidance has confirmed that employees who are on sick leave um, or who are self-isolating as a result of the coronavirus are entitled to statutory sick pay. Um, an employer can place them on furlough leave only after their sick pay period has ended. So you can't be on sick leave and furlough leave at the same time. Um, and you'd only place them on furlough leave if there's no work for them to do or if they can't work from home. If they can work from home, then you would hopefully be able to agree that. Um, employees who are shielding themselves, so if they're part of an extremely vulnerable group, um, they can be placed on furlough leave. And the government has obviously provided updated guidance in terms of who is um, extremely vulnerable and what kind of category that falls within. So um, I suggest you look at the guidance on that if you're unsure. Um, maternity leave, there are quite a lot of questions about maternity leave and how that um, works within the furlough period. Um, and the position seems to be that employees on maternity leave can be placed on furlough leave. Um, and the scheme 
has said that actually if an employer is paying enhanced contractual maternity pay not in, not all employees do but if you're paying enhanced contractual maternity pay then you can recover 80 percent of those enhanced payments through the scheme which is positive for employees who are paying enhanced um, maternity leave wages um, however if they're only paying statutory maternity pay it seems to be the case that um, you would need to bring their maternity leave period to an end if you're going to reclaim 80 percent of their wages so um, it seems to be that you can put an employee in maternity who was on maternity leave on furlough leave and you can reclaim 80 percent of their contractual enhanced wages but if you're going to reclaim 80% of their normal wages, if they're on statutory maternity pay, it may bring their period of maternity leave to an end. Once someone has come back from maternity leave, you can place them on furlough leave as usual as for any other employee. I'll hand back over to Rob now, thank you. That's brilliant, very informative. We've had four or five questions from the floor. Uh, I've, I've directed them to Ed and Dave. So uh, Dave, did you want to pick up on some of those? Yeah, the first one that's come through is uh, a question here from uh, Michael Harmon. It says, if a staff member is on a set contract but also has uh, normal overtime over an extended period, uh, will this be included in their pay for the 80%? Ed, Late, that one? Latest guidance says that past overtime, so if they were regularly earning overtime in the past, that can be used as part of the calculation of their normal pay. If, does that answer the question? Do you think? Yeah. Over what period do they need to look for the overtime? Is there is there is there words on that or not? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, for salaried people, uh, no. Okay. So I think you would you would need to just look at what a reasonable average is over perhaps a you know three month period. But there's no specific that 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 may be a detail that comes out when the claims portal opens up when we're expecting more guidance on how you do your calculations. Mm -hmm. um, but I would have thought, you know, looking back over a, I mean, for for for, for hourly paid or variable contracts, it's going to be over the last twelve months that an average is taken. So I guess the safest thing to do if you've got the data is to look at what the average has been over 12 months and include that in their normal salary. Okay, and then another question we've had is uh, that um, we understand obviously the furlough is a minimum of three week period, um, but uh, is, there, is there a minimum period that you can take them back before you furlough the, them again? So can you bring them back into work for one day and then furlough them again for another three weeks? This is one of those areas that uh, it doesn't, the guidance doesn't say you can and it doesn't say you can't. So our interpretation, and Andrew might want to, 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 to comment here as well, is that it, it appears you could bring, once they've done three weeks, you could bring them off furlough for a day and then put them back on again. It, there, there seems to be no specific um, length of period that they've got to be off furlough again before they can go back on. Yeah, that, that's my understanding as well, Ed. The, the scheme says as long as, an employee is on furlough leave for three weeks. You can then either rotate or bring them back and put them on another period. So there's no limit to the amount of time you can put them on furlough. The only restriction we're aware of is that they must be on furlough for at least three weeks at a time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what happens if someone refuses to be furloughed? Um, well, <laughs> the, 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 they stand to be... Um, they stand to be treated like they would have been without the furlough scheme is my sort of uh, is my answer and Andrew, Andrew again might comment this, on this in a more uh, yes yeah, so, way but uh, they might they stand to be made redundant or laid off yeah so the purpose of the furlough scheme is it really kicks in when there's less work or no work for the employee to do so in usual situations putting a furlough leave to one side it would either be layoff which is unpaid leave or short time working if you've got the right under the contract which should obviously be for less pay or worst case scenario actually a redundancy situation so when you're writing to employees with the letter that you need them to sign to give their consent then it would be sensible to say in that letter well we want this to work 
Um, but the alternative to this is that we may have to consider other options, which could be your redundancy. So if an employee refuses to go on furlough leave and you know they can't work from home and they need to go on furlough, then I think at that point you'd have to consider other, other options and that could be a, a redundancy procedure. Um, just to bear in mind there as well, that might bring into, um, into force the collective consultation obligations because at that point you might be saying as an employer, well actually now we are proposing to dismiss if it involves 20 or more employees. Great, thank okay. you. A couple more questions that have come in, one from Steve. I'd like to pay a bonus to those that are still out there helping to secure a uh, business future. Uh, is that okay? Uh, well, that's one for you, Ed. Uh, well, yeah, I don't see, I assume that means to employees who are still working, um, in which, and no, I don't see any anything wrong with that okay. at all. Okay, another one, perhaps this one for you, Andrew. Can, can staff carry out training whilst they're being furloughed? Yes, yes, they can. Um, as long as they're not generating any revenue um, for the employer, they can. Um, and, of course, they can do volunteer work as well. We've, we've seen the emergency volunteer um, scheme come into place as well. Yeah. Um, so, yes, they can. But the key thing is that they can't be paid um, and it can't be to generate any um, any revenue for the company. That's a key point, isn't it? Because one element of the furlough scheme is to uh, plug that cash flow hole in the short term. But the other side of the coin is that we want to be in the starting blocks when we when we get when the gun goes off. So it's a subtle balance, isn't it, between furloughing and keeping the business ticking over. Um, it's, it's a it's a difficult balance to strike, isn't it? I speak from first-hand experience of that. Mm -hmm. It is indeed, and um, so. But I think the flexibility that it affords, uh, being greater than we thought initially it might do, is is actually quite helpful in you being able to move things around during the period. Yeah. Can I just mention one other thing on the training point? Because as far as I understand it, the if if training is voluntary, then um, that's fine. If if, if you make training mandatory during the furlough period, you've got to make sure that your employees are paid at least minimum wage. Right. Is that seen as work? It's allowable, but they have to be paid at, the, at least the minimum wage. So it's ideal if, if you make training available to people to do if they wish. Okay. Another question here about can furlough staff be paid a top up? Um, Yes. Yes, they can. You can choose and many companies are depending obviously on their cash position to uh, top up the 80%. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's very clear. And this one's and, and Ed, can you can you choose which employees you want to pay more to and uh, uh, perhaps pay some 90 100% some 80% or are you, are you discriminating in any way? Um, well, you need to be careful about the basis of those decisions because, as Andrew mentioned, discrimination law still operates. And so, you know, you'd need an objective basis on which to do that. And so our general advice is to treat people equally. Um, and Andrew may have a, another comment on that. Yeah, as, as Ed Riley says, you, you don't have to top up the wages, but some employers are doing that. Um, we think there would be there would there would be a risk if you did treat people differently and you don't treat people consistently. Firstly, from a discrimination point of view, if you were doing that um, for unlawful reasons. Um, but secondly, from a trust and confidence um, angle as well. So obviously, if you've got some employees who you're topping up to 100% and some you're not topping up at all, um, for those you're not topping up, um, unless there's a good reason why you're not, um, there could be a trust and confidence issue there which um, could mean that they look to potentially resign and, and walk away and potentially bring a claim. So I think you'd need to have a very good reason to, but generally speaking, it's, it's safer and better to treat everyone consistently on furlough. Thank you, Andrew. I know that we've talked a lot of, rightly so, about the technical aspects, but in terms of the more sort of generic, soft, um, but equally as important approaches to dealing with furloughed workers, Matt, would you um, proffer any uh, suggestions for uh, our, our people to uh, keep in touch, communicate uh, with them during these, these trying times? Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, more communication, the better. 
uh, give people information when you've got it and as quickly as you've got it. I think one of the things that's come across for me uh, listening this morning and seeing the questions that come up is that Ed and Andrew have done a, a fantastic job of explaining how furloughing works, but this is complicated stuff. And when people are going through listening to things that are complicated, particularly in times where there is uncertainty and there is change, maybe they've got worries about loved ones who are dealing with the virus, levels of anxiety rise. And when levels of anxiety rise, if there's anything that I've learned from experiencing communications, it's that our communications become more and more important. So I, I kind of say, while you are talking to people, as leaders of organizations within businesses, wherever possible, do simple things well. That one of the things that you probably don't have much of at the moment is time, but give people the time that you can. Listening to people at the moment is going to be uh, massively important. Just doing simple things like getting eye contact with people when you're talking to them. It, it sounds incredibly simple, but the more that you can give people focus, the more that you can demonstrate to them that there's a level of empathy because you may be giving them news that they don't want to hear. You may be giving them news that is going to affect their livelihoods, their family. The more empathetic you can be in the way that you, you do that, the better. And to go back to just what I was saying at the start there about giving people information, don't assume anything. Don't assume that uh, I'm going to understand this information. There's nothing wrong with checking in with people and asking them questions. Does this make sense? Do you understand why, why this is happening? I think in general terms, the more communication, the better, and the more human the communication, the better. There's obviously an element, elephant in the room, which is that we're all working virtually at the moment. We're not one-to-one, -one, uh, and maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later, Rob. Thanks, Matt. Tracy, I'd like to get your um, view on this as well. So please, um, from your perspective, yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it, you know, echoing a lot of what's already been said, and you know, particularly, Matt, you've seen an awful lot of anxiety out there amongst business owners who are, they may be worried about their own health, their family's health, uh, is their business going to survive? Um, and it's the same for their employees as well. Um, yeah, I've seen some business owners that have been incredibly quick to adapt to, you know, high street retailers that have shifted online within a week. Um, you know, others that have said, actually, the grants and everything that are coming through will give them enough cash flow for them to effectively mothball their business for a, for a couple of months and then they will revisit things when the when the situation changes um, i think you know also seeing that you know a lot of businesses might have their own support networks but you know as ed and andrew have kind of indicated you know this is a very complex area and it really is important to get expert advice because there are some bear traps out there and you could get things wrong very good advice, Tracy. I want to bring back to Ed and Andrew on, uh, we've had a question in, um, that talked about non-furloughed employees. Can you insist that they, they continue to take booked holiday rather than cancel and take the time off after the lockdown? What, what are your views on that uh, for you, and, or Ed or Andrew? That one up. Um, yes, um, if, they've, if they've already booked it, then um, you know, I think you can reasonably say we want you to, to take it. Um, I think what's sensible is to say to staff, well, actually, we need to keep our business running effectively here for the remaining period or the holiday period. So what we can't have is that you know, we get to the end of the holiday year and everyone's cancelled their pre-booked holiday and everyone's taking it at the same time. So um, for those people who aren't on furlough leave, um, you are able to ask them to take holiday. Um, but I think what's probably reasonable is to send out a, an amicable communication to say to staff, look, if you've got pre-booked holiday, we would like you to still take that. Um, and we do encourage you to take holiday um, balanced and, and at intermittent periods throughout the year for your own well-being, but also so that we can continue running the business effectively and there's not a backlog of holiday at the end of the year. Okay, very good. So I think communication is key there. Okay, and Dave, uh, I think it'd be really useful to, with men's is working so hard at the moment as most businesses working across a whole range of different sectors, it might be worth tapping into Dave's experience. So Dave, uh, any insights from your first-hand experiences of this? Yeah, I, I think my, my wife I just talking about men's experience, to be honest, because, because um, you know, we're, we're, we're experiencing, um, you know, a drop in, uh, in the work that we undertake. So, so just to give people a bit to, uh, 
um, or Menzies. So Menzies have uh, employed 420 people um, across seven offices um, and there's 42 partners. Um, now, um, we were in a fortunate position because we invested quite heavily in IT um, over the last two years. So every staff member um, either have um, a laptop or have um, remote access from home. Um, that was more um, luck than judgment, to be honest, but it's, it's paying dividends at the moment. Um, so when the government announced uh, that uh, people should be working from home um, if they can, which I think was the 16th of March, um, every staff member has, um, has worked from home. Um, one thing I would say is um, uh, I, I think our communication has actually improved somewhat um, since we've been at home. You know, we've now, um, we're now having uh, daily team conversations, um, which we weren't necessarily doing in the office. Um, we are um, embracing technology. Um, so we're using Skype for business. We're using Zoom. Uh, we have a, a Starleaf video conference system. Um, and um, it, it's interesting, in the accountancy world, some uh, accountants, so the big six, six accountants, took some decisions on, on the 16th. Um, and a few of them uh, furloughed staff straight away. Um, a few of them uh, offered uh, unpaid sabbaticals. Um, some offered um, staff um, to take uh, leave at 30% um, of their salary. Um, what Menzies did, we just sat tight for a while. Um, and we're fortunate that, um, you know, we, we sell time at Menzies, so we can see from people's timesheets um, how, um, uh, how, how, how chargeable our, our staff are. Um, but um, what we have seen is that um, across our various different service lines, um, there's some service lines which have seen um, an increase in activity, for, for example, our payroll team, um, with the questions they're having, um, Ed's HR team um, have been the same. Um, but we have um, seen a few service lines where um, work has been delayed. Um, so, um, you know, we've seen a number of clients who are actually having a set of accounts prepared um, or an audit undertaken isn't high on their agenda at the moment. Um, so we have... Um, you know, seen a reduction in work there. So we, we took the decision at the end of last week to, to furlough some of our staff. Um, we had um, video calls um, with every member of, um, of the team. Um, and overall, um, most of those staff were um, understanding um, of the situation. Um, so we furloughed them for a minimum of, um, of three weeks um, for the moment. Um, we have um, turned off um, the furloughed staff access to um, various software packages we use. Um, they do have access to our, our training software um, that we use. Um, but things like emails, um, timesheets, um, they can't have and they don't have any access to those. Um, what we're, I think, I think what's a, what is a challenge, um, and probably Matt might be able to add something on this, is um, how you keep in touch with staff when you're working from home, um, both furloughed and non-furloughed um, staff. Um, so for us at the moment, we are having um, a virtual... Um, a drink at five o'clock on Friday, just in various teams. Um, we're doing quizzes, um, but I think it's a challenge just to keep in touch with, um, with the teams. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is every client that I speak to is affected in some way um, and different clients are taking different decisions. Um, but, um, you know, there is a, there's a lot of uh, concern out there from business owners. There are, but um, yeah, hopefully that helps just to share uh, Menzies, uh, Menzies' experience. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We, we've had another technical question in, uh, and it's linked to HMRC's guidance on employees hired after the 28th of February 2020 cannot be furloughed. What options in, does an employer have with those employees? So maybe one for you, Ed. Yeah, so I think with those, with those people, it's really a question of looking at what you can or can't um, afford to do? Can you afford to make use of them even in some limited capacity and keep them on in that way with reduced pay? Um, or do you need to agree with them that in effect they're going to be laid off unpaid um, for a period of time? There's no, there's no furlough, um, for, you know, furlough grant for them. So it's, I think it's a question of trying to come to some agreement with them as to what you can afford to do, if anything, um, in order to either keep them employed um, but, but dormant or, or otherwise to make them redundant and perhaps look to rehire them again later. Okay, thanks. Andrew, I don't, don't know if Andrew's got any further. 
Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think the only other thing to add to that is, of course, if you've got an employee who joins past the 28th of February 2020, um, they don't have two years service. Um, so from an employment law point of view, um, if you were to dismiss them, then they wouldn't have a claim for unfair dismissal. Now, I think Ed's absolutely right. You would want, as a good employer, to, to look at those other options first of all and see if you could retain them. But if, if it came to the point where you needed to dismiss them, it's a safer dismissal than an employee who's got more than two years service, subject to um, day one rights, which could be a discrimination claim or an automatic unfair dismissal claim. So you need to take specific advice on that. But as a general point, it will be a safer dismissal than um, an employee with two years service. Thanks, Andrew. Ross, I want to bring you in. I know you've got some perspective to add on this. Yes, thanks very much, Rob. Um, it's really a, a, an overview from a number of businesses that we've been engaging over the past uh, few weeks. And uh, with so much of the, the industry, and particularly in Hampshire, being in the service sector, it's interesting to see the way that the service businesses um, have been impacted and the different decisions that they're they're having to make and I think it reflects some of what Dave was saying. A, a lot of businesses are based on ongoing annual contracts with clients you know, whether that's in technology, in marketing or whatever other services but where they really make their success and where they grow as a business is through the 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 project development work that they do for their clients but these are often the same clients so they have a great deal of difficulty right now to try and furlough the right staff and the right kind of relationship, uh, uh, maintaining the right kinds of relationships with those clients. So they are making decisions around placing skeleton staff in the organisation, but the flexibility that's needed from the three-week um, furloughing arrangements, I think, is really welcome because it enables them to maintain relationships with clients who are saying that during this let's say lockdown period, they want to take on some development work, maybe work that gets in the way of the kind of everyday contract delivery that they do as a business. In the chamber ourselves, I mean, you're actually witnessing part of that here because obviously becoming more of an e-chamber is part of what our longer term ambition is. But this allows us to really try these things and to engage our membership in the business community. But I think marketing businesses, technology businesses and others are in the same boat. So it needs a great deal of fluidity and flexibility and skill to be able to furlough the right people and to still build teams to deliver against those contracts. Thanks, Ross. I've got a three or four questions, specific ones I'm going to pick up and then I'm going to hand over to Matt. Um, so one of the questions that, that came in was, are employers still allowed to recruit for degree apprenticeships as they wouldn't begin until the start of the academic year in September? So, I do, shall I do that, Rob? Because um, Menzies actually take on apprenticeships each year. Um, so we, we, we tend to take on 24, 25 people each year. Menzies are recruiting and have recruited for our September intake. Um, I think it, depending on how long um, the current position continues, it's whether September would be the right time for them to start, but we are continuing to recruit our apprenticeships. Great. Uh, thank well, you. I think it's you know, worth remembering that the whole the, the purpose of this scheme is to ensure that business can keep running. And so I think making the continuing to make those plans and and, and to line those people up is, is actually important. It may be, as Dave suggests, that you just need to maybe be a little bit uh, flexible in arrangements about start dates just to account for where we might be yes. in September. Very good. I'm going to pick up on another question. Um, so what happens if we have someone on three weeks furlough and the restrictions lift midway through that period and we need to bring them back into work? Can staff be furloughed if they have a vulnerable uh, person at home? Uh, okay, I think that's two questions. Two separate questions, yeah. 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 So the, the answer to the first one in terms of if restrictions are lifted and someone comes back to work midway through their three week period. Well, as far as the rules go at the minute, um, if they don't do three weeks, then you won't get the grant for that period. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's the way it stands at the moment. Now, wh whether if everything came back and the government were encouraging people to get back to work and in those cases, furlough periods were, you know, were terminated early. They may, maybe there could be some flexibility, but currently all we can say is 
if it's not three weeks, you wouldn't be able to make a claim for that yeah. for that period. Okay. Let's, Rob, um, is it worthwhile? A few questions are coming in about um, directors, um, and I must admit, a lot of the phone calls I'm having with clients at the moment is is directors and whether they should furlough themselves. So we, we've chatted about um, that, that directors can be furloughed, and it's only their salary um, element, um, not their dividend element. Um, and we've said that they can't do any work. I just wondered if Ed or Andrew have, have got any advice for people about how they don't fall foul of any of those uh, uh, those rules. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks, Dave. Any thoughts on that, Ed? Andrew? Uh, well, it's a it, it is a very topical question, and it's uh, from my perspective, I don't see much wriggle room. Which I mean, I would love to. I'd love to see more wriggle room, but um, everything I'm seeing is reinforcing the point about not undertaking work that including things that generate revenue or, or provide services to the business. And as I mentioned in my early comments, that the additional comment that came out at the weekend was, was a, quite an intriguing comment from HMRC, actually, that you are free to allocate, you know, important tasks to other people who aren't on furlough. Well, of course, it, it was almost a comment that didn't need saying, because of course companies can do that anyway. But I, so I can only think that they mentioned it because they're saying you can't work, mm -hmm. you know, there should, there, there should be no work done on furlough. So that, that's my interpretation of where, where we are with that currently. Yeah, I must admit, I had a chat with one client who uh, we had a long discussion on it. And I think, um, you know, a lot of companies are structured in a way where they take a minimal salary and dividends. Um, I think this uh, individual could take if um, if they furloughed for three months, they might they might um, receive a, a grant of say fifteen hundred pounds from the government. Um, the, the director's um, view was actually they would generate more value for the business if they focused on uh, marketing, BD, um, uh, their pipeline, um, admin work, um, and so on, um, rather than to claim um, the grant itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. I think I want to bring one of the. Um John, who uh, asked a question about uh, the supply chain. I wondered, John, if I unmute you, would you be you'd be uh, happy to share your question with the uh, the team? I'm going to unmute you now so you can uh, share your question. Let's see how this goes. The floor is yours, John. Can you hear me? In the absence of John, who's speaking, his question. And please cut me off if you do um, if you do hear me, John. The order book is still intact and we have been in a nominal slowdown in orders and at this moment are keeping our employees busy, but the supply chain has been affected. So if we get to the point where we have staff waiting for deliveries to arrive, which have been delayed, is that a valid form uh, from a furlough perspective? So Ed, would you like to? Well, we're seeing, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of clients have been been able to keep going until this point and, and theoretically could continue the issue being, the, but the issues are becoming ones of supply chain pro uh, problems and then, uh, and obviously business sort of dropping off at the other end. I think uh, the answer to the question is yes. I mean, if, if you can see a three week window where um, there's going to be a delay in your supply chain, make use of that three week window if you can to furlough staff and bring them back if you think that there's going to be work available again um, after that period. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, I've, sorry, sorry just, to, just to add to that, Ed, I think that's absolutely right. The only thing I would say is that the whole purpose of the scheme here is to kick in when you would otherwise lay staff off or make them redundant. So if it does get to a stage where you think actually um, I'm going to have to lay this that these staff off or make them redundant because of the breakdown of the supply chain. Then yes, the furlough scheme would apply at that point. Yes, very good. Tracy, you had a point. Yeah, I was just going to build on what Dave was saying. Actually, um, you know, it's that conversation. As some business owners are in a position where they're starting to think about recovery strategy or looking at their business model, looking at whether they can shift some of their business online, um, and some aren't. But I think for the businesses who are starting to think about that it does have an impact if you think about who you want to furlough um i think building you know on what i said the you know, that flexibility to to put people on furlough mm -hmm. bring them off put them back on is good 
Um, but you know, from my perspective, from a marketing perspective, if you are thinking about communications to your staff, to your customers, then you might want to think about actually who it is that you you keep, you don't furlough, um, but also about those projects that you might want to be looking at when the restrictions are lifted and when you want to take your business forward again. Yeah, so that's very good. And sort of a sort of strategic objective look at the definitely yeah. yeah who needs to Rob, we've got a um, another question come in that says uh again probably for uh, ed or andrew that can we remain in contact with clients even if we are furloughed even if it's just for a quote mm -hmm. i'm assuming the answer is no to that one no. well again I, one of the specific examples given as to work that cannot be undertaken is work that could that, that generates revenue yeah. So to so to me responding to a quote, I mean I hate to say it, but to me responding to a quote um, is in that category. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think that's right. And I think the other thing to say is that HMRC can obviously audit all these claims, and it may well be that they say they've got the power to investigate if any work's been done. And of course, that you can't do any work, so that would be a risk. Yes, I suppose that auditing work would be aside from looking at your accounts, they can see that you're. You know, the revenue may have been switched off. Uh, other ways that they could audit you through, you know, email traffic. How, how would they do that? I don't think it's currently clear. Um, they haven't given us guidance in terms of how they would go about the auditing. Um, I, I think generally it's going to be whether staff are eligible to be put on furlough. You know, whether the the information you've input in the portal is correct, etc. Um, but it may be that they ask further questions in terms of whether work's been undertaken, etc. Okay. We have, a, we have, we have, a, we were talking about this the other day internally. We have, we have a theory and it's no more than that, which is that because they're not asking for specific details on individuals who are being furloughed, what, what HMRC might be doing is looking at a claim that comes in and looking proportionately at whether they think the, the size of that claim is kind of within the parameters that they would expect for, 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 for your business, given the data they've already got. Sure. And that if there are, if there are claims that look out of whack to your kind of size and scale, size of your payroll, size of your profits, whatever, that you might then kind of go on a list for, you know, for audit uh, later. But as I say, that's that's that that's a theory, although based on some um, well-informed people who've, who who are close to HMRC and who've worked with them for many years. Sounds like a, a sound uh, observation, Matt. Can I just bring Matt in now, Matt? You had a point to make. Yeah, just going back five or so minutes to Dave talking about uh, how Menzies have changed and they're now working in a different way remotely. I think one of the issues that leaders are going to face and businesses are going to face is that their teams have suddenly overnight become virtual teams. Well, not overnight, but over a period of time. And in, in terms, Dave, of your question about how do you stay in touch with people? How do you communicate with a team that you're not sat next to every day? I think that the, the, the first rule was be structured about it. So uh, allocate people within your team to keep in touch, even if it's not you that are doing it, but put some kind of time frame. The idea of a, you know, a five o'clock virtual beer or a cup of tea on a Wednesday afternoon is great. And I think one of the things that we found is that those those communications don't have to be work based. It doesn't have to be that you're putting across information. That can just be to check in with the welfare of everyone, check, check how everyone is. And, and, and actually, as human beings, you know, we're going through a crisis at the moment, but we are adaptable. And one of the things that Ross said at the beginning of the session is that there will be opportunities within this. And I think one of the opportunities is gonna be for organizations and industries that are changing, and ours is certainly changing through this, is going to be to look as a leader and as a business and ask the question, you know, how do we want to be at the end of this? Do we want to be working more remotely now because we've proved we can do it? And if we're going to do that, how do we communicate as human beings to make that work for us? Yes, thank you, Matt. I think that it might be quite nice now that if anyone from the um, would like to make, raise a hand and share an experience with us, that would be really Really good. So if anyone would like to do that, we'll monitor the uh, participant panel and uh, we'll, we'll invite you to speak. Um, and if anyone would like to do that, they can go ahead and do that now um, if they wanted to. So Ed, from um, while we're waiting for 
Uh, Simon Jameson, I think, um, is keen to come in. So, Simon, I'm going to attempt to unmute you, and uh, you have the floor, sir. Uh, can, you, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, Simon. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Um, we're, we're, we're a rail business, um, so we're obviously still a, a, a key um, supplier, and we've got guys out working. Um, we've got certain individuals that are, have got young families or people that um, – you know, maybe high risk at home, or even some that are, uh, you know, asthmatic and things like that, their cells that can work normally. Um, but they're now saying that they, they're not prepared to come to work. Now, to me, that would almost be a, a normal layoff position. So, to me, it seems um, that they could be furloughed. But there's a, there's a whole discussion um, in our own business of whether that's appropriate or not. And I just wonder what your views were. Um, shall I? take that Rob that there was one one of the bits of advice that was added over the weekend which I thought was really helpful is that employees who have caring responsibilities that make working difficult are eligible for furlough it's That's also the, it's also the case that anyone who's been told to shield by the government who's in possession of one of those letters um and this comes back to a question I think that, that you know that double question I think we missed the second part of that um so so, so employees who are shielding under official advice they're, they're eligible for furlough and so if you add the two things together if you've got people shielding at home and others at home with caring responsibilities for them furlough yeah okay is there, is, there, is there a sort of measure of that because it might be somebody just saying oh, I've got a young family I'm not prepared to put my family at risk um, I'm not going to go to work. Um, so, you know, under, under that to me, their health hasn't changed. So under the ordinary environment, they could be carrying on working. But because of uh, external conditions, they are, they're unable to carry out their duties or unwilling to carry out their duties. So I would lay them off if furloughing wasn't around until some other work could come along. Mm -hmm. If I may just come in at that point, I, I, think, I think the other thing to consider there is um, if, if furlough has to be by agreement, so an employee can't um, force you as the employer to put them on furlough, um, it has to be by agreement. But if they do fall within one of those categories, so either they're shielding because they're vulnerable, or they're living with someone who's shielding, um, or they have caring responsibilities, so therefore they could go on furlough, but you as the employer decide, well, actually, I don't want to put them on furlough, I think you're going to have to be quite careful about how you have that conversation with them and just explain um, why you don't want to put them on furlough. But what you would need to consider there is obviously you've got a duty of care um, to that employee um, and you don't want to breach trust and confidence as well. So it would be a case of kind of explaining what measures you're putting in as the employer to protect them in the workplace. But, but Ed's absolutely right. They, they now can be put on furlough leave if they fall within one of those categories. Right, so that's a good change in there. I mean, there's no, there's no animosity. I mean, the individual just saying, well, I'll stay at home and won't be paid. Um, you know, he's, take, it, he's taking it that seriously, and that's what he'd like to do. Um, I'd prefer to actually furlough, because I think he's got a valid point. So it's, it's, a, it's an awkward one. <laughs> there are, I mean, I have had conversations where that there are people who actually don't fall into any of those categories. They're not shielding, they don't have care responsibilities. They simply don't want to come to work for because they're concerned about contracting the virus and I think those are some of the most difficult and to Matt's point those are where some of the most sensitive handling as a as a manager is going to be required in terms of understanding their concerns looking at the measures you're putting in place in the workplace in order to ensure that you're looking after the safety and applying social distancing and all of those kind of things because right. you really don't want a situation where you've got someone saying, I don't want to come to work, and you're saying, well, you need to, and you're not covered, you know, by any of the specific guidance. Um, you know, those are going to be really difficult conversations. Okay, I'm going to bring somebody else in now. Thank you for that, Simon. Um, Stuart, uh, Stuart McGonney, I'm going to unmute you, and you have the floor, sir. Uh, good morning, uh, panel. Can I just say thank you very much for the information you've shared with us this morning. It's been very informative. Um, well done, Ed, and well done, Dave. Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> um, I'm still struggling with this furlough business in respect to some of my staff uh, who want to communicate with the customers. So they don't want to do it all day long. They, they get an email in from somebody overseas or they get an email in from somebody. They want to respond. They don't want to leave their customers. 
exposed. And uh, they only want to do two or three hours a day. Um, and they respect that the fact they shouldn't be working, but they're concerned that when we come back to work, whenever that is, effectively, they're going to have to pick up all these inquiries and all these uh, and go back to the customer. And the customer says, well, we've still been working during this time. You know, we've still been operating a, a, um, a train a railway or, or, or we've been operating um, an industry. We, want, we wanted a response from you three weeks ago. That's about point number one. Point number two, I've also got accounts people that say, look, I only need to come in two days a week. Uh, I don't need to be for five days a week. I'm concerned about the, the cost of the business and how that affects the business. And they also don't want to take the mickey. So is there anything you can sort of assist with that? Or is it still back to the, to the blatant, you can't work? <laughs> um, well, Stuart, I know I, I, I totally appreciate uh, your, your feelings around that. I'm not sure there is an easy answer other than to say, I know of other clients in similar situations where they've managed to look at whether there's one person who can not be on furlough or can come off a of furlough who can actually pick up a range of things that might not normally be their, you know, their role, but, um, but you know, that you can plan for that person to be off furlough um, either temporarily or permanently in order to roll those things up. Sometimes in one or two cases, because the you know the director who as we've said you know there may be limited benefits to furloughing it may be that they're in one or two cases they're picking having to pick a lot of those things up um and in finance teams you know seeing whether there is a period at month end where someone comes off furlough for a week after a three-week period manages the accounting requirements and goes back on I, I, I'm not sure there's much else to say that other than communication here is absolutely key with your customers and suppliers in terms of where you're at as a business and what you're doing and what they should do in the meantime, you know, to um, manage their expectations, I guess. Ed, the other thing that was suggested to me is, well, why don't you furlough us? And then at the end of three weeks, put us back on full pay for a week and then unfurlow and furlough us again. So effectively you're paying us for time we've done in the furloughed weeks, <laughs> which is a sort of a, which is a sensible way of looking at it. You know, we're not taking, you know, we're not milking the government for four weeks furlough. We're actually only taking the, the, the three weeks and actually somebody has been working, but we're actually paying them the full amount for, for one week. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to smile at that one. Right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's an interesting one. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I think you know the the parameters are fairly clear, and um, certainly bringing people off furlough for a week in order to get things done and paying them accordingly, absolutely fine. I think okay. there's a balance to be struck, isn't there, Stuart, between complete lockdown and mothballing and being yeah. ready to sprint out the blocks when the starting gun goes. It's back to that subtle balance isn't it and it's about um you know a, a good a good definition of, of good judgment is um making um good decisions with imperfect data we're, we're absolutely smack bang in the middle of that aren't we yeah. i just wanted to bring in um a, another contributor uh, matthew has been we're sitting patiently so uh, you have the floor sir uh, thank you very much rob um Thanks very much for the um, very well conducted uh, online meeting. Um, I've been taking some notes for everyone uh, while it's been uh, happening. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly to the point about virtual working. We're a small services company, not untypical in um, Hampshire, as uh, I think Ross and Ali said earlier. There are an awful lot of us. Um, we're also one of these small companies that after the financial crash of um, 08, 09, um, we're entirely virtual from the start and we're dispersed. We're not just based in Hampshire, we're based in Birmingham, we're based in Cambridge, we're based in Kent. Um, we're not a conventional business in some senses, although we're about to be conventional if we aren't already in the last three weeks. And I wanted to speak very briefly to the point that Matt Burgess made around communication and managing expectations. You do not need, you do not need to make an enormous set of new rules for your virtual working. In fact, the fewer you have, the better. But do establish clear behavior lines. 
around um, what is acceptable in your instant messaging or your the ways that you're communicating with your your workers and i'm talking about a team of less than 10 and uh, obviously many of you will be having teams that are much bigger than that and beyond that um good luck can i come in there rob let's go ahead matt uh, Matthew, yeah, a, a great point. For instance, if you're working virtually, just uh, create the convention that when you're working, everybody has cameras on, if you can. Uh, the, the, your communication experts will tell you that the importance of what you do physically in any communication is enormous. And if you take that physical communication out, communications very quickly can become misconstrued. And also, Frankly, if we're running a virtual meeting and I can't see you or you can't see me, just understand this. I'm going to be doing at least three or four other things. So the thing that you're doing needs to be conducted in a fashion that engages as much as you can. So, so make sure you have cameras on whenever you can uh, and, and talk to each other. This is going to sound obvious, but talk to each other about the elephant in the room, which is we're not here. We're across a screen. How do we make it work? What do we need to do to ensure that everyone is part of the meeting? Because there will be people in your team that sit back slightly when they're, when they're not in the room. And, and, and your job as a conductor, a facilitator of a meeting is to, to engage and bring everyone in when you can. That's great advice, Matt. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Mark. Mark, so I'm going to unmute you and you have the floor, sir. Morning, morning all, and uh, thank you. Really informative, much appreciated. So thank you to all of the panel. Um, two things from me. One was something that we found massively beneficial is we do have an outsourced HR professional. Uh, clearly, we've uh, got uh, the guys from Menzies on today. Uh, for anybody that's not doing that, it's the best money that we've spent this year. It's not a big cost, but the, the clarity it can bring and the pace it can help you to act with, I'd really encourage people to do that. Um, the, the, next, the next part for me is a challenge that we have. Um, that I'm just wondering if there's any lobbying others can do because listening, it, it sounds very similar. What we've ended up doing is we've ended up following seven of our operations team and then having to hire two of our previous members of the operations team on two days a week who are followed from their other occupations, which just seems crazy. It seems crazy to me but it's, what we, it's the route we've had to go. And I know the government scheme of kind of funding 80% for people doing nothing is massively beneficial, but actually I'd far rather be having to pay 50% 50 wages for three of my full-time team. Is there any sort of lobbying and stuff that, that, that people can be doing? Because I'm hearing lots of people having, having to manage through the challenge and actually not wanting 80% of funds for all of the people that are there. Is there any, any advice or thoughts on that? Do you want to pick that one up? Ross is you're, you're on mute, Ross. Ross. I think I'll pick that up after. Could could I ask Andrew first of all to to say a few words and then I'll pick that up afterwards, Andrew. I'm not aware of, of any lobbying, I must admit. I don't know if any of the other panel are, are aware of that situation. Um, I suppose what I would comment on that is um, you know, it's some employees are in the situation where they do need staff to do some work. And so it might be a case of putting them on short time working um, if you've got the ability to do that. But of course, with short time working, it's reduced hours and reduced pay. So um, it, it, it is not easy for the employer or the employee in that situation. But from a lobbying point of view, I don't know if any, any other members of the panel have got any insight into that. But... No, I haven't. Andrew, just to pick up on that short term working, am I right in saying as well that if you reduce someone's hours, you then can't furlough someone at a later date? Is that correct? Um, my understanding is that if you reduce their hours, you obviously your pay reduces accordingly. Um, if you then got to a stage where you needed to furlough them, I think you can still do that, but it will be on zero, it will be on no working again. What you can't do under the scheme is um, put someone on furlough leave and they remain on short time working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the guidance, the guidance, the initial guidance was a bit confusing on that, Dave. It sounded, it sounded as if if anybody had been working short time, you couldn't then furlough them. But no, you can furlough them. But as Andrew said, they can't yeah. be doing that. I mean, the challenge, the challenge that we saw was that we ideally would have had a couple of people on forty percent pay for forty percent time, but actually their colleagues were going to be furloughed and get paid eighty percent for doing nothing. So it, it just didn't make sense. Hence the route that we kind of ended up following everybody. I think the important thing with this is that the uh, 
Chamber of Commerce network as a whole has been trying to lobby for as much flexibility as possible within these arrangements. But I, the reason why I wanted to hear from Andrew first, because I think there's some practical issues around this that we need to actually say, okay, what, what's the best way of actually managing within our own business? And obviously what are the, the legal constraints around that? But the issue is that I think we've probably gone as far as we can with, with government lobbying. I think the government has set a paradigm and it's it's up to the businesses. It's it's not an easy thing. I'm in exactly the same position myself. Set a paradigm in order to make decisions around the best way to run the business within within those constraints. Um, and it does sometimes, I do agree, look like it's a little bit unfavourable to some groups of staff compared with other groups of staff, and a little unfavourable to some groups of businesses and some sectors of businesses compared with others. But I think they do. They did probably provide a pretty good broad brush response to the circumstances that we found ourselves in. Now, my job is to lobby government to get it as perfect as possible. But the problem is that you do tend to sort of drive out the good in search of the perfect. And that's sometimes the, the problem that we have. Yeah. So I would just recommend that businesses work with each other to come up with ideas and, and, and ways in which they can operate together. A lot of businesses are working very closely with each other, who have always worked with each other, whether they're in the supply chain to each other or whatever, to enable the businesses to, to as efficiently and productively as possible, continue to deliver the kind of work that needs to be done as a priority and be flexible and fluid around those other areas. It's easy for me to say, I realise, um, but it, it just does require, you know, an amount of, um, you know, innovation and uh, enterprise to make that work. But I don't have any solutions. I think we've probably lobbied as far as we can. But we take these messages. I, I said them to Enterprise M3 and I've said them to Solent Lep and they have said them up to government. I've said them to BCC and they've said them up to government. But I think we've probably got to, as far as we're going to. Thanks, Ross. I've got a point bring, um, uh, Lisa in now. She's been patiently waiting uh, for a question. So, Lisa, you have the floor. Can I unmute you? I'm trying to unmute Lisa, but uh, not having much joy. So, um, Lisa, you're still there? Hello. Hi, Lisa, you're, you're on. Uh, hi, yeah, sorry, my questions, they were actually answered. Um, previously, it was about um, if the lockdown ends midway through um, a three-week furlough period. Um, but I also asked about where someone is feels that they are shielding someone at home who's vulnerable. Do they fall under the furlough scheme or not? Because I can't really get a, you know, I can't find a definitive answer to that. So that's somebody that's caring for a vulnerable person at home. Um, not not caring, but they have someone in their household who is deemed as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, sorry, if I if I just come in there, the, the updated guidance over the weekend um, says that you can claim for furloughed employees who are shielding because they are vulnerable, or um, they need to stay at home with someone who is shielding themselves. So um, if they do need to stay at home with someone who is shielding, then they can be furloughed as well. Great, thank you, Andrew, that's very, very thank clear. You. I'm conscious we've got five minutes left. We've got one other contributor that wants to say something, uh, Gid4, excuse me, that's your, uh, your handle on Zoom. Gid4, I'm gonna give you the floor. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry, my name's Graham Andrew. Uh, I'm just looking to get you know, an idea and feedback uh, from the professional community and whether this coronavirus business interruption loan scheme is working or are people getting enough enough out the back of that i have my own opinions on that but I just just wanted to kind of put that forward and if it's working efficiently enough particularly if this goes on uh for much longer dave is that something yeah should i answer that yeah i mean from our our client base uh, I, I think the uh, uh, announcement was good from the government i think what we've lacked is a detail behind it um, so, I mean, there is a session in a couple of weeks time, I think, on funding. Um, I think that the number of clients we're speaking to, uh, there was a lot of confusion at the start about personal guarantees as well. And uh, quite rightly so, a lot of people didn't want to sign up and give a personal guarantee. 
Um, those um, have been relaxed now, I think, for loans of under quarter of a million. Um, but I'm still, we're still not seeing um, uh, probably the amount of clients come through which need lending. So, you know, we did one recently for a restaurant. Um, the, uh, the bank didn't know enough about the scheme to actually do it under uh, uh, through the um, uh, new government scheme. Um, so um, I think the answer to your question is that there uh, isn't enough activity going on at the moment, um, but hopefully we'll find out a bit more in a couple of weeks' time when we have this session again, which is, uh, which is on funding. So in terms of the question that's just come in from Chris about any idea when grants will be paid, is that any, any clarity on that, Dave? Uh, no, not yet. I think, I, mean, I think Ed said right at the start, the plan is to, the portal will be open in April. Um, and the plan is to pay it out quickly after that. Now, um, our quickly in the government's quickly might be two different things. Um, but um, yeah, we haven't had any guidance yet as to when when uh, the timing of the payments will be. Okay, thank you. The other aspect of grants as well is the um, grants for businesses eligible for small business rate relief or um, those in the retail, hospitality and leisure industry. And that's being done by each um, district council so a lot have forms that people have to complete to make sure they go to the right bank accounts um i know that the money was delivered to um all local authorities on the first of april so hopefully as long as they've got their processes in place that money should go out quite quickly okay thank you for that tracy just conscious of the time we've got a couple of minutes left um i think we'll probably close the formal session at, at this point um just to let you know that this has been recorded and it will be made available on a link so you can look back uh, and see what has been said. We'll also be putting some FAQs up on the Chamber's website, uh, Menzies, uh, Dave and Ed and Nikki, uh, who's also on the call, have put a huge amount of work into uh, updating all of the government advice and putting it into a very user-friendly way of accessing it. We'll make that available on the Chamber uh, website. Um, before you all go, in the spirit of getting feedback from you all, we put together a very brief uh, poll just to give us some feedback on uh, your experience this morning so that we can improve uh, future sessions. So I'm about to launch a poll on your screen. You'll see four questions, and we'd just like you to quickly tick uh, which questions um, reflect your experience. So uh, you should be able to see that now. Can I invite people to? Work through those questions, please. As you're doing that, the next session is scheduled for a week's time and it's uh, looking at businesses in distress. It will be headed up by um, Simon Underwood, head of advisor at Menzies, and uh, familiar faces on this uh, session as well. Same time, we'll send out a new invite via the chamber. Those that still haven't completed, of 30 seconds or so, and I'm going to hand back to Ross, who will formally uh, close this particular session. So Ross, you have the floor. Sir. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, firstly, I want to thank you, Rob, actually, for what a superb piece of chairing. Um, the technology may be difficult, but you certainly seem to be expert in it. So thank you so much for all of your hard work. And and actually getting us to this position to be able to put this session on. It's, uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. But, uh, basically, I'd like to thank Rob, Dave, Ed, Andrew, Matt and Tracy for their brilliant uh, panelling today. It's, um, it's been very enjoyable because um, we've shared information in a way that I think has been extremely constructive and, uh, and very pertinent. Uh, it's, uh, it's not only pertinent because of the situation we find ourselves in, because it's the exact questions that uh, businesses are wanting to to be answered at this time and uh, and i think the sharing across the whole of the across the audience and through the chat has been really really an example of uh, building a wonderful community of practice and hopefully for our future sessions which are taking place 
uh, each Tuesday at 9.30. As uh, Rob said, we've got them on distress, we've got them on funding and on cash flow in the whole of April. And thereafter, uh, we will be looking to the new opportunities to build businesses uh, through this period and into the future, uh, that we are building a community of business interest here that will really make a difference for us all. You know, we've heard a lot today. Uh, we've heard a lot around employability, but we've also touched upon some of the subjects that we'll be looking at in the future. Um, the, the, the banking matters, and that will be coming up in, in all three of the next uh, sessions, but also issues around grant funding, the rates-based grant funding, and of course, the money that comes through under employability furloughing. All of this is highly important to businesses at this time, and we, to actually grapple with the intricacies of it, this program, I think, has been really useful. So once again, thank you very much. If there's one message I've taken from this, and I think it, it came from, from all of you, is the importance of what one might call authentic people management. The way in which we um, uh, build our relationships during this period of, of lockdown uh, is, is going to pay dividends in the future uh, in terms of building um, trust and, and building relationships across our businesses. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the audience and thank you for such interesting questions. And I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you, Ross. And uh, I will now formally finish the session. Um, look out, looking forward to seeing you all and bring a friend, friends next time, uh, 14th of April, same time, same place. Um, can I ask the uh, panelists just to stay on the line, um, just to, to uh, have a quick catch up. Thank you all and very best of luck to you all. See you next week.